Welcome everyone to Understanding and Improving Indoor Air Quality IAQ and VOC Eating Dry Walls. This course is approved for one hour of continuing education units under GBCI, AIA, HSW, AIBD, Green Certified Professionals, and may be applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. I'm your host today and moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I'm the Executive Director at the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is celebrating 15 years this year. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, and we exist to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Uh, we want to thank our huge Platinum Plus sponsor, uh, Anderson Window, who allows us to do these sessions and supports our work, as well as our gold and silver level sponsors, Cake Systems, um, Certainty in St. Gobain, Panasonic, Warmboard, uh, as well as Black Locust uh, Lumber, we left off there. Do you support greener homes? Um, if you do, become a member, help support this continuing free webinar series. Also get discounts on on-demand sessions, trainings, live events, discounts on your LEED and Green Star certifications, uh, as well as other benefits for becoming a Green Home Institute member. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, hand it off to um, Lucas Hamilton, who can quick introduce himself and will be taking us away on some more information on understanding and improving indoor air quality. So. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, thank you very much, Brett. Hopefully uh, everyone can hear me. Um, is that true? I certainly hope. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. It is my pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Lucas Hamilton. I am the manager of building science applications here at Certainty and Sangaban, North America. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I'm a, a physicist who spent 20 years as an expert witness in construction defect litigation prior to joining CERNTEED about 10 years ago as we built up our building science offering. So I do a lot of education programs on all of the uh, types of topics that we touch today in our sustainable environment, and uh, I'm really happy to talk to you today about this issue of understanding and improving indoor air quality, because frankly, it is one of our biggest challenges as we try to address all of the changes coming to us with regards to the building code and energy consumption. We need to be very cognizant of this issue if we are going to keep on creating healthy habitats uh, that are also sustainable. This presentation has a whole bunch of abbreviations in it. These are not acronyms. These usually don't even spell other words. These are simply abbreviations, but ones we should all be quite familiar with by now, hopefully. Um, indoor air quality is just a part of the indoor environmental quality. That's where the E and the A do separate. The environmental qualities take on a whole bunch of other things as well. Um, but uh, we'll see these abbreviations pop up now and then. Hopefully, again, you are familiar with most of them. Uh, do get to know um, two new ones that might be in there, uh, or three, two or three new ones. One is going to be International Energy for Research on Cancer. It's a very good place to go to find human health impacts uh, with regards to cancer from the world around us. Um, and in that, you'll find things like specific emission rate. This is a very important topic when it comes to VOCs to understand how quickly materials are coming off of other materials around us. And then, of course, photocatalytic oxidation might also be a new term. Basically, what we means is it's like a bringing the outdoors in. We're taking advantage of one of these frequencies of light that has a power to age things in this world. So we'll talk about that a little bit coming up, how we use that to improve our air quality. This presentation is copywritten uh, and is approved by AIA and other boards, as was mentioned earlier. Um, we're going to talk about sustainable buildings and indoor air quality specifically. Um, we're going to talk about what we need to do to basically overcome the materials around us to maintain a healthy environment. Um, and this, as I mentioned before, is a huge challenge because not only is it the straight up normal emissions that are coming off of the products around you and the products you're using, it's also the secondary and tertiary reactions that can take place in this chemical world of ours. Um, there's a lot of things that we're using today that, hey, they're fine when you use them by themselves, but when you start combining them with other materials around you, you find out that there's reactions going on and materials being produced that were not 
predicted and aren't necessarily uh, desirable. So it's, it's a really important topic to become well grounded in. We'll talk about the specific differences between air quality and environmental qualities. We'll talk about the most common contaminants we find in our buildings today and talk about some remediation strategies uh, for addressing them and improving uh, those environments. And then we're going to focus specifically then on volatile organic compounds and formaldehyde, which is the most commonly found VOC inside our buildings. The topic is one which we could spend days going over. I mean, it could be an entire course in college for us, and we're going to try to do it in one hour. So we have to pick just one of the many specifics to focus on. And so we're going to, in the end, then dial down and really focus hard on the most commonly found VOC contaminant in our indoor environments today, that being formaldehyde. So what is the IEQ? Well, it is our interaction with the built environment around us. It typically is uh, several qualities that do include air quality, um, uh, but it also focuses on thermal quality, light, acoustics, and visual interest. These really are the sort of organic interfaces where the building meets you. And so it's a really uh, uh, an all well-rounded uh, discussion. However, we are going to focus really closely on, again, the air quality today because this topic itself is so diverse um, that we, we really have to dial it down because of the time constraints that we have. Um, we know that air quality is extremely important. Um, it, makes, it makes complete sense to us. What, what is, the, I guess, the challenge for us today is that you know we we've gone we've completely changed our construction materials and our methods. We've gone from a, a, a period of time when we were able to to build buildings and enjoyed relatively low costing energy, and so we did not worry about things like air tightness. We had accidentally ventilated our buildings very well <clears throat> over time, uh, and we got away with that because energy was cheap. But now, with energy being the issue that it is, we have new challenges put upon us. We are no longer able to accidentally provide good air quality in our buildings. It must now be done in a very controlled and focused manner in order to meet the other goals that we're trying to do at the same time. We can imagine organically that air is important to us. We get a lot of good quantifiable measurements and, and, and instances and research provided to us from, from different organizations around the world. Listed here on this page are four really good ones that you can go to online and find all kinds of information readily available on the topics of air quality and human health in general. Of course, the EPA, the American Lung Association, World Health Organization, oh, go there if you've never been there before. You'll see a lot of things that are on the radar for other parts of the world that are not on the radar for us for a variety of reasons. So pay attention there. And if you do want to see things that are very similar to what goes on in the United States, pay attention to Health Canada. They use similar materials to us. They have a very similar population to us, and they have very similar issues to us because for the most part, they live very close to our border. And so it's another great place, a resource to go to to understand and learn about the impact of pollution on, on human health. Um, you know, and it's not just pollution outside, it's the pollution inside that we're talking about today because of the fact that we spend most of our time inside, as much as 90% of our time being spent inside, according to the US EPA. And I'm going to suggest to you right now that if you consider it, our time inside is but a blink of the eye of our existence. These systems that we're walking around in right now, these bodies were not developed inside buildings. These were developed outside of buildings, the natural world. Their history inside buildings is relatively recent. So the things like your endocrinological system, all your, all your chemistry and everything going on with you right now was never developed for being inside buildings. So the impact buildings has on them is really unique. And so we have to pay very close attention to it. The impact on your, on your health with regard to air quality alone, we see quotes here like the American College of Asthma, talk, Allergy and Asthma talking about as much as 50% of all respiratory illnesses are either caused or aggravated by poor IAQ. Now, in the past, before sustainability got really well entrenched and we had a lot of data being generated by it, these were mostly faith-based decisions. You and I both knew that good air was important. We both knew that we wanted good air for our families and for our businesses, but we didn't necessarily have the quantifiables to measure the impact of good versus bad air on those businesses and on our families. However, right there's a statistic that should shock you. 50% of all respiratory illnesses are caused by aggravated by poor IQ. That should read dollar signs. If that's a child being sick and not making it to school, that means there's 
a parent who also didn't make it to work that day. If this is in the office place, you're talking about things like contributing to headache and concentration problems, fatigue, right? What's the worst thing to have happen to you in the afternoon in your business? To have everyone tanking out and going face down on their keyboards, making errors, causing problems. This is all, again, today, great quantifiables to help us justify why this is so important and justify the investment on providing good air quality to the spaces that we do construct. Because in the end, the spaces that we're building, the pollution levels are as much as 100 times higher than they are outside. Now, we're going to look at some of those reasons why as we go forward, and you'll see that, uh, uh, yeah, it's the building that's the problem. It's the building that's causing us to be into these extremely high levels of concentrations. So what are these common indoor air pollutants. Well, their sources are varied, and we'll look at, uh, at, at different ones as we go through the presentation. The first one popping up here might surprise you when you see moisture. Moisture is a source of contamination in that it is a required element for many of our biological contaminants to exist in our environment. Things like mold and mildew and these other biologicals that pop up our buildings cannot exist without liquid water. So controlling liquid water is really important. And that's kind of an obvious one in that statement when you talk about mold and plants and insects and viruses and bacteria. All this makes sense. This is living stuff. But guess what? Moisture levels and humidity levels in the room also affect things like these darn VOCs we're going to talk about later because their reaction, their adsorb reaction, likes a wet surface. So higher humidity levels, which tend to, with temperature changes, create liquid moisture, create surfaces that increase the bonding and debonding rate of these VOC reactions that are going on. So moisture in our buildings is sometimes really an obvious problem and concern and sometimes not. Sometimes it's behind the scenes in the chemistry that's going on or in the biology that's going on. On. But be assured, control of moisture is your number one job uh, from inside to out in the building. And when it comes to air quality, it's got a huge role to play. Temperature and relativity extremes lead to liquid water. Particulates in the air, I think we can get we can understand that. That makes sense to us. Things like smoke and 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 different particles that you're taking into your body are obviously going to be picked up by you. You become a human filter and you have to deal with those things. Inadequate circulation and ventilation might mean things like improper O2 levels and too high of a CO2 level. You're not getting proper air mixing, so CO2 levels are starting to spike in that part of the building, again, impacting people. Carbon dioxide from people in combustion appliances, I just mentioned as being a problem, but it could also be your friend, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how to use CO2 levels to maintain proper air quality within the building. Of course, in the end, we're going to dial down to those VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Generically, these materials with boiling points below 250 degrees Celsius. So they tend to act or exist as gases in our environment near sea level. Um, and that's kind of what makes them really hard. Hey, I can filter the particles listed above here. I can get a really great filter in line, and we'll talk about some filters coming up. But guess what? The gases go right through those filters. I cannot filter gases. So how am I going to deal with them? That's our challenge. And that's what we're going to talk about, what we're going to focus on today. Again, these common indoor air pollutants being listed by the World Health Organization, if you look at what they are, in terms of ranked importance, hey, let's start off with carcinogens. I think we all understand how important that is. Look at number one, formaldehyde. Formaldehyde was classified several years ago as a human carcinogen. We always kind of suspected something was up out there. I mean, those of you that ever scratched your head and wondered about your biology teachers, what was going on there, perhaps it was too much formaldehyde exposure from all the frogs that were in those jars. Maybe it's the VOCs from, say, the FEMA trailer that's on your mind. Maybe it's the new car smell that's on your mind. All of these things should be on your mind, all these related to VOCs, and that's why not just formaldehyde, but total VOC content is important. While formaldehyde is the most commonly found carcinogen VOC in our buildings, to buildings today, there's a lot of other stuff going on. That new car smell I mentioned, by the way, that's benzene. That's another VOC and another bad actor you should get off your list. Radon gas is listed third. Radon gas is a silent killer. Oh, we have a whole slide coming up on radon gas. I really want you to leave today's presentation having a new respect and, 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 and sort of understanding of radon gas and, and not treat it as casually as 
perhaps cavalier as we have in the past. I know as I personally have in the past before some personal lessons brought it home to me. Other common indoor air pollutants, again, are things like CO2, but you can use it. Relative humidity, you can control it. And airborne particles, you can filter them. These are a little bit easier to deal with, and we'll talk about that again coming up. They're not as scary as those first three that we did list here. Remediation strategies for contaminants in our airs most commonly are going to be talking about dilution. A lot of people believe dilution is the solution. If we can simply get 100% fresh air in the building every hour, we will have much better air quality. The problem is it's an energy penalty. You don't get just to bring in outside air. You have to clean it and condition it. If you're in a heating cycle, well, you've got to heat it up for the first time. If you're in a cooling cycle, I got extra bad news. Not only do you have to cool it, you've got to dehumidify it. And that's a huge energy chump. That really takes a lot of energy out of you. So this is why you don't want to run at 100% fresh air all the time. Yes, it improves your air quality but there's other constraints on us that prevent us from doing that. You can remove your particles with proper filtration, properly designed filtration. We're going to talk about humidity control and dehumidification. Active dehumidification with your mechanical system is the best way to go. But controlling the humidity by having passive design elements that allow your building to properly breathe is really a great way to start. Have it just sort of passively set its own levels and control its own levels, and you don't need as much of the active stuff going on. Because every time I hear active, I hear dollar signs. I hear energy. I have to be really careful about how I use my active technologies. Active technologies are also more expensive and break down and need maintenance. So again, I'm going to depend upon my passive technologies as much as I can to improve the situation as far as we can go before start pooling on energy and active technologies. You must control your building air leakage. Air leakage, hey, I implied earlier that if it was, you know, totally air open buildings that their air leaky buildings had great air quality. That's somewhat true, but the problem is when you have, say, uncontrolled air leakage, the air you are pulling into your building, the makeup air that comes in, and this may be a good time to stop and mention a little physics, okay? Your building wants to be at a neutral pressure with the environment around it. It does not want to have a higher pressure inside or a lower pressure inside. Nature is always seeking a state of equilibrium. So if you're at a higher pressure, air is going to flow out. If you're at a lower pressure, air is going to flow in. So as air flows out of the top of your building because it's warm air rising up and out, makeup air is going to be pulled in. Makeup air to bring your building back to a neutral pressure level. Well, when you bring air into your building in an uncontrolled manner, the air usually takes a route or a pathway through the worst parts of your building, the concealed spaces. It comes in, it cracks at floor lines and corners, and then works its way through walls. And guess what's inside all of these concealed spaces? Over time, it's contamination. It's all of the, the, the bits in the air and the things that you don't want that you're not taking care of in your filtration or in your cleaning of your office spaces. It's residing back in those concealed spaces. So now this is where your fresh air is coming. You're basically guaranteeing your fresh air coming in is going to be as contaminated as it could possibly be. So this is why you have to control building air leakage. It's not saying eliminate it. It's not saying be zero. It's saying that have controlled exhaust and controlled makeup air. Reduce the pollution sources by specifying low emitting materials. Uh, and when you build your building, make it a clean building and capture, again, pollution sources using passive and active systems both, but max out your passive first. This is the most wise, you know, cost of ownership approach to staying clean over time. Now, I mentioned that ventilation is, a, is one great strategy that this dilution solution does work if energy is not going to constrict how much and fresh air you can bring in. There's been a lot of studies, and this is great now that we have studies in place to help us have these fact-based defenses for what were those previously faith-based decisions. Now we have evidence of why this is important. Why should schools have good air quality? Well, we have great measurements here of going on on what's going on with kids in schools. When we look at the effect of poor air quality on these students, you see things like respiratory infections, allergies, adverse reactions to chemicals. Again, every time I hear that, I don't just hear about a student and a child who's not learning or a child who's not in school. I hear about a parent who's just been pulled out of work. I hear about a visit to a doctor's office. I hear about all these associated things that start coming down the line once you start getting bare air quality. The impact on, on, on the space and on these children is not just an impact on learning. It's an impact on the entire family and the family's finances. So, hey, how many times can we talk about this? All this stuff is interrelated. It's extremely important. You take a good move up front and you improve the air quality for the child and it's improved 
improving everything for the entire family. Again, great having these evidence-based design facts coming into us from experiments, uh, like the one we're talking about here with the impact on students. Um, it helps us, again, justify why we are urging to spend the money up front to make a better designed and better controlled and operated building. Now we design, control, and operate this building in terms of air quality under the guidelines of ASHRAE standard 62.1. 62.1 was written for commercial buildings, 62.2 is for residential buildings, and it is our benchmark for what minimum air quality needs to be. Um, this is what, this is, again, this is our bare minimum of care. It does not mean that you can do better than this, that you should not be doing better than the standard. You should be trying to do better than the standard at all times. This is a bare minimum of care to maintain human health inside of a building. It's going to talk about how much fresh air do you need, how much filtration do you need. Oh, and be warned here, you know, lots of warnings thrown out there. In our upcoming highly insulated airtight world, Fresh air ventilation is extremely important. I mean, I shouldn't be the first one telling you this. You guys are into sustainability. You know that we've been preaching now for a few years in building science. If you're going to build it tight, ventilate right, okay? Super insulated buildings tend to create moisture. Super airtight buildings have have ventilation issues, so you must pay attention to this as you go forward. If you're going to save energy, you're not going to live without paying attention to these kinds of issues. The goal is to reverse and minimize these adverse health effects on occupants. Wouldn't it be nice if the building you spent your day in was the best air quality possibly available to you? I mean, you deserve that. When it comes to your home, your family deserves that. All these things are measured, and again, the, the importance cannot be understated. Actually, 62.1 one has several different uh, uh, aspects of the building they're going to pay attention to. They're not only going to talk about the ventilation rates and things like that. They're going to focus really hard on the air distribution system because this is the system that connects everyone in the building. So if you're going to have contamination problems occurring, the worst place to have them occur is in your ventilation system. So you're going to pay attention to this. The air stream surfaces that are in that system must be ones which do not uh, promote the growth of biological contaminants and do not wear down over time to contribute more particulate to the airstream. So you must have really good airstream services. You must control your contamination levels and you must have contaminant capture. Okay, and it's not just saying filtration here again because you can't just filter gases. You can filter the particles, but you've got to capture everything. You have to capture the gases and you've got to capture the particles. System moisture management is also focused on ASHRAE 62 because Biological contaminants cannot exist in our environment with us unless they have liquid water. So you must keep that system dry. And here's a document telling you about how to have air quality, and it's saying, oh, yeah, by the way, pay attention to your building envelope, uh, because if you get moisture occurring in your building envelope, you're going to have funky biological showing up soon thereafter. And again, it's in those concealed spaces where they take off and they get happy, and your uncontrolled building makeup air is coming through them and carrying them all into the environment with the people. So it's going to focus on all these issues to make sure that air quality can be maintained in the building. When it comes to filtration, ASHRAE 62.1, and in general, in terms of filtration today in our buildings, we do refer to efficiencies in filtration with regards to MERVs, M-E-R-V. The average filter in your home is a four to five MERV. It's about 50% efficient at catching six micron sized particles. That's not so great, right? That is not good enough, actually. Um, if we talk about critical environments, you can only go up to a 14 or 15 MERV filter in places like hospital operating rooms, so you can get that clean with that kind of a filter. Could you drop a 14 MERV filter in your home uh, heating and air conditioning system? Yeah, you could, and I guarantee you, you're going to be buying new fans within a year because the pressure built up by these heavy-duty filters, if it's in the same half-inch thick slot that you have in your home system, the back pressure developed by that 14 MERV filter is going to be so sufficient, it's going to burn up the fans. Now, you can get a 14 MERV filter that has the same resistance as that little half-inch filter in your home furnace now, but it might be like four inches thick. That greater thickness actually allows to have less actual resistance. So you could drop it in there, but your system won't take it. So if you're going to use high filtration systems without having fan problems and using up all kinds of extra energy, make sure your systems are designed to handle these wider 
bigger filters, then you can operate at lower pressures and work much better. Pay attention to that issue because you can't just up the filtration without affecting the rest of the system and the system's long-term durability. When you improve the air quality in a variety of different lead programs, you can start scoring some exceptional points. Um, lead version 4 for, uh, for, for building uh, design and construction, we have points available for going to filtration mediums 8 and above. We can start scoring ex exceptional points when we go above 8. Remember, 8 now, 8 is roughly twice as good as that furnace filter you may have on your, your, your home furnace right now. So that's a pre-requirement. That's a prerequisite that you are going to have something at least twice as good as most people are living in at home. Hey, get even better, and we can score even more points. But to get better, we have to do it by design. We can't do it accidentally. In your homes, by the way, in your tighter sealed home, filtration is important. Pay attention to this issue. Think about what kinds of filtration improvements you can make on your home filters. We see on new uh, new construction energy star guidelines, which is that prerequisite for leaper homes, is going to have these things built right in. Right again, they're going to minimum uh, uh, minimum higher filtration levels, MERV eight. But you're, think about how you can do this at home to your own home today. Even if you're not going for these scores, improve your own filtration. Talk to your mechanical contractor about what you can do to improve your filtration without changing out your fans and changing out other parts of your system. Now, radon gas. Um, radon gas. I try to. You know, even though I'm a scientist and I've been educated on all this many, many times, things don't really become necessarily important until they become personal. Uh, I did not give the proper amount of, of importance to radon gas in my own considerations in the past. And then in my 40s, after living on top of coal for an entire lifetime, I developed a thyroid disorder that is directly linked to exposure to radon gas. So now I'll be on maintenance medications the rest of my life because of having lived on top of radon and not had proper radon control in the older homes I lived in and the older buildings I've existed in. Um, radon is a naturally occurring gas. It's radioactive gas that occurs in the same geology as coal, and so it very often exists in areas where you are above coal. Um, it is a lighter than air gas, so it wants to move up into the environment. If your house is in the way and your house does not provide or your building does not provide the proper resistance to that gas, the gas simply comes right up through your building and exposes everyone inside of it. Um, the final statement there you see is lung cancer is a primary effect on human uh, health and exposure. Here's a shocking number, 14. 14% 14 of lung cancer in America is related to radon exposure. Can you believe that? 14 percent? You know what the impact? You know, you can figure out the impact is on our, our on our society from this issue. It's huge. And the thing is, as crazy as we can deal with this, it's just a lighter than air gas, right? How do we make that? How do we deal with that? We give it a path of least resistance. We get it around us. There's the map of the U.S. in radon exposure levels, and they're quite high. The dark red areas are the areas where we've got coal, and these are areas where radon gas is most commonly found. If you are in a high-risk area, you must do radon remediation today. You must put in mechanisms to make radon go around the house if you're in new construction or around the building if you're in commercial construction. Um, if you're in existing buildings, do radon testing because radon can be remediated after the fact as well. It's not that difficult and not that expensive to get the radon around the building as opposed to through the building. Um, it is really something that it became very personal for me, and so now, if you can hear it in my voice, it is a really important issue. Everyone should pay attention to it because it does change people's lives when it's not dealt with. And, and this is uh, Brett here real quick, and I wanted to interject with something on that side too. If you want to go back one slide real quick, um, you know, we uh, actually in a, in a, in a zone um, what I believe, uh, what yeah, Zone 3 did several home energy testings on some homes and had them all do radon tests and was very surprised to find that, uh, you know, some of the homes had high radon in that Zone 3 um, and even some had very high. One of them, it was funny because it was in a, uh, somebody had to, been on a nuclear submarine had been to be in one of the homes that had a high radon and so they understood what that meant. Uh, so one thing that I just wanted to point out is that uh, as you mentioned here all homes should be tested and that soils do shift and things shift and um, you know we just in our own work actually you know came across the importance of that. So. Thank you. 
yeah, I, I'm sure all of us, um, if we dig into it a little deeper, um, uh, we'll find these examples <laughs> all, all around us. And again, it, the importance cannot be under, understated. Um, so carbon dioxide, CO2, boy, <laughs> everyone's uh, uh, minds today, right? CO2 and CO2 equivalents. Um, carbon dioxide um, is, is you know, a huge part of our atmosphere. Um, there are outdoor average values. That's the OAV you're going to see up there, typically between 300 and 500 parts per million in a steady state, a state of equilibrium. Um, it is uh, uh, all around us, but the levels of it are really sensitive. We're really sensitive to changes in the level of CO2 in our environment. Um, the conditions typically associated with too much CO2 uh, exposure are, are things like headaches, concentration problems. Um, if you see the final stat there, um, improved conditions result in performance improvements in schools of 20% and office of 10%. So I mentioned before that CO2 can be your friend or it can be your enemy. Here we see some problems that CO2 can cause in our life. If we go back now and combine this information with ASHRAE 62.1, which we just went over, I want you to always bear in mind when you talk about building codes or, 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 or different kinds of, of, of metrics, there's usually a performance path and a prescriptive path. The prescriptive path is the easy path with regards to non-thinkers. Oh, everything's spelled out. It's easy checklist. I can just check the box and move on. But there's always, always also a performance path. The performance path, in the end, is usually less expensive to build, much less expensive to own and operate, and gives you better overall performance. So if we talk about the issue of CO2 and ASHRAE 62.1, ASHRAE 62.1 is going to tell us to have minimum fresh air ventilation rates based upon the amount of space, the volume, the type, the number of people using the space, and the type of activities going on. It makes good sense. The problem is with that calculation is these things are not consistent 24 hours a day. If you think about your building, it might be empty for six or eight hours. It might only be at 20 or 30 percent occupancy for four or six hours. It's, nothing is consistent. It's, it's a system in flux. So the ASHRAE standard 62.1 in terms of regards to maximum ventilation rates, what you should be providing, is based upon maximum occupation. It's assuming 100 percent occupation. No building, very few buildings are 100 percent occupied. Most of your office buildings are generally 40% unoccupied because of travel and things like that. So why are you running all this fresh air when you don't need it? Well, we know it's good for people, but we also know it's bad for energy. So if you're running 100% fresh air in the middle of the night when no one's there and you're having to condition all this fresh air for the first time, not only are you heating and cooling your building in a crazy way, you're bringing in fresh air in a crazy way. So what does ASHRAE 62.1 allow us to do? It allows us to use carbon dioxide sensors we can actually put CO2 sensors in our mechanical system to measure when people are coming into the building, to always keep our CO2 levels at recommended places so that when people are not in the building, we don't need to bring in fresh air. We just need to keep it conditioned at a certain level. When people start using the space, hey, now we need the fresh air. And guess what? The building told us that by using CO2 sensors. So I just want to bring that, that point up and point out in this one instance, although that, that sort of philosophy or strategy applies to a lot of different applications in sustainability. There's ways for us to be dynamic and fluid in measuring things as opposed to just putting out a prescriptive path and we're going to go do this. We can do that, but there's usually more expensive in the long run and it's not necessarily the most sustainable way to go. So, so I just want to make you aware of that concept and, and that possibility for improving things. Um, so the, uh, ASHRAE 62.1, again, is going to tell you things like this minimum 16, 15 CFM per person or drop down to outdoor average plus 600 parts per million or do the 700 parts per million. Um, these can be your triggers that you can use under the same guidelines to control those fresh air ventilation rates. So remediation strategies for moisture management, aha, this should be a whole course, right? Like 10 weeks for us to talk about. Um, you've got to control relative humidity. You just told me that they can't live on relative humidity, that all this stuff needs liquid water. Yeah, it does need liquid water to propagate and be really happy, but other funky things go on with regards to relative humidity. Things like dust, mites, fecal matter actually only occurs at certain relative humidity levels. Outside of that, it's not an issue. What's interesting, though, if you look at the humidity levels that we get from ASHRAE standard 55, 
which is our document, our basis for human comfort, we find out that we typically are most comfortable between 30 and 60% relative humidity. Well, a lot of our biologicals in terms of the living things, uh, the dust mites and things like that, they're also comfortable in those same ranges. What's not is going to be things like the molds and the bacteria. These very often want to have that liquid water, and that's why controlling humidity levels is important. Um, controlling, preventing liquid water from forming is critical. Mold spores uh, need a temperature of 41 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. A food source typically starts with sugar. They need oxygen, and then they need liquid water to take off. So that's why it's going to talk about the importance of controlling moisture. Fungal growth rates, dust mite propagation, and fecal matter production is actually related to to, um, to relative humidity levels. Pollen and bacteria, viruses, and your availability to viruses and infections is also based upon relative humidity. In general, stick to that 30 to 60% relative humidity. The real sweet spot appears to be 30 to 40% because above 40, 40 to 60% is where some of this dust mite, fecal matter, and different things start to pop up. So 30 to 40% really is that sweet spot for being comfortable yet, yet being healthy. So Ashley is going to give you a whole bunch of different guidelines. There's a whole bunch of different organizations out there that want to talk about the importance of moisture in buildings. Everything from NIOSH to World Health Organization, everyone's going to talk about the importance of keeping things dry. Start dry, stay dry. Don't build wet buildings, build dry buildings. Store things properly, assemble them properly. Um, stay dry while you're constructing. Ideally, the most the wettest part of your building's life is when you first dry it in because you've got things like drying concrete, drying paint, other built-in moisture that needs to get out. From that point on, things should only get better, but you don't want to overload the system. There were cases um, not, not that long ago in California, um, in Southern California, east of Los Angeles, in the desert, <laughs> where a new home builders were turning on turning over homes to new home buyers that already had mold growing them in the desert because they were building really, really wet buildings that couldn't dry fast enough in the wrong conditions. They were using a lot of water applied materials that they shouldn't have been. So, so try to start dry. You, you, you can't put in more moisture than you need or you're just going to be fighting to get rid of that moisture over time. You can use dehumidification systems, but they are energy intensive and need to be cleaned. Try to use your mechanical system properly sized to squeeze the moisture out of the air, which also means properly properly operate your system. Keep it clean. Keep the filters clean. Keep everything up to date and running properly. And then you will get that maximum dehumidification effect that occurs in properly running air conditioning systems. Ironically, the high efficiency air conditioners we use today dehumidify less than the less efficient air conditioners did of five years ago. So you can't depend upon the same old rules of thumb for staying dry. Pay attention to this. Use your calculations. Use enthalpy. Pay attention to the latent heat load issue when you are doing your calculations on air conditioning to make sure that you can stay properly dehumidified in the environment in which you are building. Here's um, our, uh, don't, get, don't panic when you see a graph like that. Those of you that still have your ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals or have ever looked at ASHRAE Center 55 might recognize that chart. That's the psychrometric chart that tells us where we're comfortable. Um, the issue here is, uh, or the message kind of here is that we are comfortable in much of the same range as some of the biological contaminants that are around us. We see that really for 30 to 40 percent, although we're comfortable 30 to 60 percent year round, 30 to 40 percent is that real sweet spot you should try to maintain year round if you want to control the biological contaminants to the best ability that you can. And people will still be comfortable in this range. It is about people first. We are building these buildings for people first. So we want to make sure that we're in that comfort range because, again, going back to all the human performance measurements that we're doing, hey, we know that this is where the money happens. This is where people operate and, and function the best. So this is where we want to be. Um, again, these are the moisture management criteria in ASHRAE. 62 is talking about keeping liquid water away from and out of the building, keeping things dry. When you do, of course, LEED is going to step in and say, okay, great, we have requirements for this. We have, we have pre-requirements for adherence to ASHRAE uh, standard 55 on human comfort. We also have ISO standards that we're going to be shooting for. ISO standards, by the way, are EU standards that would mimic either an ASTM or an NIST or uh, other American-based standard that we would use in our construction uh, documentation processes. Um, 
specific issues with mold, mold, should be moisture and mold resistant materials out there. ASTM uh, D3273 and G21 are the places you're going to go and find issues and talking discussions about moisture and mold resistance. We've talked about the building envelopes so far. I also want you to always think about those wet stacks inside your buildings, away from those outside walls where you've got water pipes and drain pipes running up and down. These are also areas that you should pay attention to by using moisture and mold resistant materials. Moisture and mold resistant materials are critical in these areas because, hey, even copper pipes get pinhole leaks over time. Everything is either leaking or going to leak. That's kind of a healthy way to look at it. So get ready for when the leak occurs. Either make sure that you can catch it right away or that the materials you're using in the presence of that leak are ones that will be resistant to moisture and to mold growth. Because chances are they're going to happen in a concealed space and you're not going to see it right away. So you're going to want to make sure that you have some built-in durability to take that event on. Remediation for building air leakage. There's a lot of different pressures that are causing the building air leakage to occur. But in general, remember, your building's going to want to be in a neutral pressure with the outside. Those pressure differences could be caused by the wind blowing across your building, creating a positive pressure on one side and a negative on the other. It could be the stack effect, which is the warm air rising into the top of the building, making the pressure in the top of the building higher than the pressure outside, causing it to leak out. But when it rose up, it created a lower pressure in the bottom of the building, causing the air to leak in. Or you might just have mechanical pressures going on. The biggest fan wins. If all your fans are pointing out, guess what? You're going to have uncontrolled air leakage coming in somewhere because that makeup air is going to have to get in there. So controlling these building air pressures is really important. Having a properly designed and installed building air barrier is critical to make sure that you're not suffering from the energy and air quality penalties that go along with uncontrolled air leakage. In your building, though, think about your design. Isolate those pollution sources. In a residential building, it's easy. Create a detached garage and keep it the heck away from your family and put everything you don't like out there. Problem is, in your commercial building, hey, everything's going to have to live there with you. It might even be the garage underneath you. It might be things like uh, uh, photocopying. It might be all kinds of weird things that might go on depending upon the use of the building. So pay attention to what kind of contamination can occur in those spaces and try to isolate them. Do not allow them to communicate with the rest of the building with regards to air flows because you're storing things in those spaces specifically to keep it away from people and airflow will carry it in. Things like the attached garage, the bottom garage, the garage in the basement of the building, such as in the photographs here. Think what happens when that elevator door opens up to connect the garage to the people in the condominiums up above. What happens? All the air in the garage rushes into the elevator shaft and goes right up to all those floors where all those people are at. So all the cars idling, the maintenance materials stored down there, everything becomes comes connected to the rest of the building the minute the elevator doors open up or the stairwell door opens up. So be really cognizant of what you're storing. Isolate those pollution sources with regards to this air leakage path. It's very often air that's carrying the contaminants into the building. When you do this, lead, lead version 4 for homes is going to say, okay, no garage attached to the building. <laughs> Disconnect it. Um, or if you are going to do it, you have to be really, really compartmentalized to make sure that you can keep those sources out of, of, of your home. So volatile organic compounds, winding it down now, getting down to this thing that I was kind of warning about up front, this really big issue that we have inside of our buildings. VOCs are carbon-based chemicals. They tend to evaporate really easily. Again, they have boiling points below 250 C. So they tend to be gases in our rooms or in our life. The problem is VOC concentrations are much higher indoors than outdoors. Well, this is kind of like a head scratcher at first. You could go in, and most VOC production is outdoors. It comes organically from some, some uh, biological degradation. It comes from the burning of fossil fuels. It comes from industrial processes that are vented directly outside. All these things are like outside. So why in the heck is the VOCs, why are they so high inside my office building? It doesn't make any sense. Well, the fact is that ultraviolet light is the great oxidizer in our life. UV light outside will basically give things like formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is a half-life of 14 days outside. The problem is <laughs> we keep old Uncle UV out of our buildings intentionally because UV also gives up a half-life. UV light ages everything that's organic. We, we fight UV light and keep it out of our buildings. And this is one of the reasons that the formaldehyde levels, the other aldehyde levels and VOC levels continue to creep up because they're not getting filtered by our mechanical system, which is only grabbing particles, and there's no UV light in here to oxidize them, so they just get bigger and bigger all the time and the concentrations go up. There's a listing of the VOCs that are found inside our buildings. The most dangerous ones either H end in hide or ENE. ENEs, by the way, are aromatic hydrocarbons, and these are things, think of them as fuels or solvents. Uh, you know they're bad. 
The problem is we bring them into our buildings. We use them when we construct the building, and then we bring them in later with the commercial and the consumer products that we use. There's all kinds of things that come off of those products that come into these buildings. And this is kind of one of our challenges. Hey, you and I can sit down now and design and build theoretically the perfect building that's perfectly clean, but that's only 1% of the building's life. 99% of the building is going to be out of our control, and people are going to use it and bring stuff in, and those things are going to become part of that environment. Things like formaldehyde. Um, I used to like the blue, the blue sweetener. I like artificial sweeteners. I used to put the blue sweetener in my coffee in the morning. And then I found out that as soon as I drank that coffee, I was emitting formaldehyde. It was coming as a reaction of me consuming that sweetener. So again, this is kind of what goes on that other 99% of this building's life is how we use the space. So we really have to pay attention to these issues because we have to keep the space healthy for the duration of its existence. And again, these are the volatile organic compounds that are here. And we live in a chemical world, right? We always think chemistry is the, the next greatest solution, right? Better living through chemistry. The problem is we're very often pods in the process, PODS, portable organic detection systems. Usually it's when we go wrong that we find out that something went wrong. And so, so some of these consumer products we bring into our lives today, they're brand new in the market. They sound great, but then when you actually go check them out, you're like, wow, this is really emitting a lot of stuff into my life I need to pay attention to. Many of the VOCs have short and long-term health effects. Now, how these things affect you will depend upon a bunch of stuff. The type of VOC, how long you were exposed to it, and how, what was the level of exposure. Now, when you look for where these VOCs will react with us, you're going to notice that they are reacting with the wet stuff. They go after the wet parts of your body. I mentioned this earlier that, hey, moisture content is not just about biological contaminants, that moisture levels can affect this adsorb reaction of VOCs. This is where I'm at. This is what I'm talking about. VOCs are, we're trying to clean up VOCs are like playing a whack-a-mole. Remember that game at the, at the carnival? You know, it pops up, you try to hit it, it disappears. That's like VOCs because they desorb and adsorb constantly. And here I'm saying adsorb, A-D, not A-B. Absorb is going to something. Adsorb is adhered to the surface of something. These are chemical reactions that make these materials want to bond to surfaces. Well, there's temperature required for the chemical reaction to take place. This reaction, in order to come out of a material, needs heat. It's an, it's, an, it's, an, it's an endothermic reaction. It needs heat to get going. So when a temperature gets warm in a space or on a material, that's the temperature needed for the chemical reaction to place, for the desorption to play, take place. And the chemical reaction occurs where it debonds from material and it comes off of the environment. Okay? So now the mole is up. Problem is, as soon as the temperature goes down again, it's a reverse chemical reaction, and it goes back into materials with mass. So now the mold is gone. So every time you're trying to clean this VOC out of your life, it's popping up, it's going down, it's popping up, it's going down, it's moving all the time. But what goes after you, it goes after those wet things. It goes there, and that's where you start to have these reactions from headaches to nausea to nerve problems. The experience can be quite scary when it happens. You might not know what's going on when you've had an extreme exposure. But usually, you're going to know that something is weird. You can sometimes smell it, sometimes you can't, but you're going to know something's wrong and something's going on. And again, these VOCs are, are often very mysterious because um, the levels are constantly changing around us. Um, so where are the VOCs coming from? Well, some of them are coming from materials that we're bringing into the home. Um, they're coming off of, and formaldehyde, by the way, was a part of, uh, urea formaldehyde, which was our favorite binder. When I say binder, think glue. It's our favorite glue in the world. We made everything using this stuff, from the furniture that you might be using for a desk to the stuff that we slapped together to make manufactured wood products for, for framing to, to anything that used a glue or an adhesive, basically, at one point in time had these materials coming out of them. So they were in all kinds of building materials that we brought into, into our buildings and made up our lives. But, you know, again, that's just part of it. That's the 1%. The 99% is the rest of that list at the bottom. These are the things that the user of the space is going to be bringing in with them and going to be emitting into the space. So it's the materials you use and the materials you buy. Um, it's, they are all around you. They're part of our, our modern chemistry lifestyle. Now, there's all kinds of, of products that you can measure the off-gassing from. The off-gassing will, will come off into an enclosed space with a really good air barrier, and it, concentrations will go up. And again, these will have short and 
long-term effects on a person. You can buy these low and no VOC products, say, and use them in your building, but again, it's incumbent upon you to also educate the user on these buildings on what sort of materials they should be bringing into their lives, and this is for that sustainable purchasing uh, that we have to teach everyone about going forward to use these spaces properly. Now, um, carpets, which have a lot of glue in them, have a whole carpet industry association looking at these VOCs coming off of them. Um, There's labeling going on for carpeting because it's one of the most renewed and refreshed building materials inside our existing buildings, and that's that backing that is producing most of this. Um, So Lead Version 4 has a variety of credits available for reducing the impact uh, of VOCs on our, our spaces, and there's a bunch of different places you can go to learn more about what those guidelines are and where those levels should be. Again, the materials that are putting them into your space might be the wooden agrofiber products. They might be the binder in the materials that you're building and using. These are all all things you're going to want to do in your lead calculations. There's a a budget uh, method and there's a strict calculation. There's two different methods you can use for calculating the VOCs in the different lead programs today. But it's a great exercise to go through early on and help you pick products that you're using because um, uh, once a product gets into the space, the off-gassing begins. And, and again, it's really hard to clean up. You can't just filter these VOCs out of the air. So use materials that are certified, that have a recorded emission rate. Look for things like Green Seal or Green Guard or SCS certification on these emissions. Get measured products. If ever there was a good reason to buy local and buy domestic, a lot of foreign manufactured materials are not tested for these issues, where ours are. So you might be buying material from overseas that you cannot get information on. However, I can guarantee you for most American made materials that you're using in your buildings today, you can find emissions re, uh, uh, records for the products at one of these or a, one, another organization involved in the subject matter. EPA has guidelines, California has guidelines, uh, uh, everyone's got guidelines for how much emissions you can be living with. So look for materials that are measured to these. Green Guard Environmental Institute has a thing called Green Guard for Schools and Children, which is the most restrictive uh, emissions program in the country. That today is called Green Guard Gold, and it's run by UL Environment. So if you have a material that's a certified Green Guard Gold, that's the lowest emitting product you're going to get your hands on, and it'll work and fit within anyone's guidelines and usages. There's a bunch of different criteria in LEED for VOCs. Here we can see the different methods of calculating. I don't want to focus on this too much because we don't have enough time to dig into this slide, but there's a lot of different places that you want to pay attention to where the VOCs are coming from in your materials and in your products today, and LEED is actually a place you can go and look for it, because they're going to call them out and ask you to pay very special attention to them. I want to spend the rest of our time today talking about formaldehyde gas, because it is the most commonly found VOC in our buildings. Look at that graph. This is an indoor versus outdoor record of of VOCs, and look at number one, formaldehyde. A human carcinogen is the number one most common found VOC in our indoor air today. Again, most of the production of this is outside. The problem is without ultraviolet light inside, it sticks around for a very, very long time. Um, The concentration of VOCs or the formaldehyde coming off of a given material depends upon a whole bunch of stuff, such as the age of the material, how well it's been ventilated over time. If you took the material and put it into a really hot box and blew air across it for a a number of days, chances are you would drive off all the VOCs before they had a chance or formaldehyde before had a chance to sink back in. So how long it's been in use will have an influence on how much is still coming off of that material. The concentrations, again, vary daily and seasonally because of this whack-a-mole game of planes with adsorb and desorb going on all the time. It is a known irritant, and it does have a slightly pungent odor. Think high school biology laboratories. That smell is the formaldehyde smell. You will pick it up when it's in the room with you, and it doesn't smell good. It smells bad. And if it is bad, it smells bad. So, so, so pick up on that clue and go with it. Now, we have some guidelines here on exposure rates, and I want to pay attention. I want to pay attention to a couple of different terms or, or things right here. Look at that California uh, uh, EPA uh, uh, listing on exposure rates, acute, interim, and chronic, okay? Acute, one-hour exposure, 76 part per billion. Interim, eight hours exposure, 27 parts per billion, okay? That's what California is saying is the maximum exposure rates that people should be uh, uh, dealing with in, in California today. Um, so they went out and did a research study <laughs> on new houses turned over in California, and guess what they found? The formaldehyde levels were not only 108 times or it should be measured in 100 times homes, not only were they much, much higher than outdoor levels, 
they were exceeding the recommendations. Indoor concentrations were greater than 40 parts per billion. Let me go back one slide. What did it say? Interim, eight hours exposure, 27 parts per billion. You bought your new home in California and you moved into it within eight hours. You had exceeded your exposure limits. I guess you're supposed to move out for the next 16 hours and not come home again. Houses being turned over today are in unhealthy levels of formaldehyde concentrations. Our commercial buildings are likely in the very same state. We are turning over new buildings that are not healthy with regards to this issue. What we see is the carbon conclusions. Ventilation may not be the most effective solution because part of the problem with ventilation is if you're doing it in warm weather, you might be bringing in humidity, which is again a moisture issue that changes these reactions. It's not always the best way to go. Source control and air cleaning are all you can do. Cut down on the sources and for gosh sake, clean the air. Problem is, how do you clean the air? We've already talked about, hey, filters won't do it. Now we have some ways to measure these levels. We've got some different ways to measure the emission rates so we can have these recordables to you. That's how we get the Green Guard Gold certified materials into our buildings. But how do we capture these gases? Well, there's a couple ways. There's phase change sorption. There's gas phase sorption. These are the two principal ways that we're going to capture these things like formaldehyde. Phase change sorption is when that gas sinks in, when the formaldehyde sinks in to a material because the, the space got cold, we grab it. We react with it. We do what the sunlight would do if we were outside. We use chemical components to oxidize that formaldehyde gas and stop it from being a VOC. The oxidized formaldehyde gas is actually no longer a VOC. Once the chemical reaction takes place, VOC gone. The new chemical compound creating this reaction is one which has typically an affinity to bond to the substrate we've put this reaction into. Um, you see a picture of a wall board there. As an example, this is a technology we're currently using today with gypsum wall board. We can use gas phase sorption to strip the VOCs out of the air and capture them. We can also use gas phase sorption. That's activated charcoal. Problem is, activated charcoal, when you heat it up, it comes back off. So those are typically the two ways we're going to go after those gases. We also have to pay attention, though, in terms of non-gas things. We have to pay attention to those biological contaminants. So we're going to use things like antimicrobial coatings. When it comes to everything, though, and we can try the photocatalytic oxidation, we can put UV filters in our mechanical systems to improve this performance. But one of the issues with this is that, hey, usually when the gas is blowing past the UV filter, it's moving really quickly. So it has a limited effectiveness. The UV lights work best on systems that are turned off, not on. So that's one of the problems. They're not quite as effective on systems that are up and running all the time. So one of the best solutions we have for formaldehyde today is this contaminant capture technology of absorption, adsorption going on at the surface of the gypsum molecules in the gypsum board there is today. There's an example of it. I think that someone's going to come on afterwards to tell you a little bit more about that product once I get done. But there's the graphic talking about how this chemical reaction is done and how you're actually using your gypsum wall board to clean the air. Again, a passive technology that'll last forever. Here's some proof that it works, proof that dramatically decreases the formaldehyde levels in the room and that those formaldehydes are not re-emitted over time. These are permanently captured and permanently taken out of the air space. Again, you can go with things like activated charcoal or silica gel, but they're not permanent. They do not permanently capture the material. They're waiting to desorb again the minute the temperature comes up. So in your buildings, we've talked about a lot of things with air quality. Use every one of these technologies. I know we focused on the VOCs at the end and we focused on, on formaldehyde, but pay attention to gases. Pay attention to particulates. Keep your air clean as you can possibly do it because frankly we are not getting cleaner over time as we make our buildings tighter and tighter. It is our challenge going forward so we have to do it in a very cognizant and controlled way. There's a quick description uh, of, the, uh, of the UV photocatalytic oxidation reaction that goes on. What we're doing right here is we're trying to copy what's going on in the outside world. And so we're using more of these technologies today, mimicking nature, biomimicry. It just makes sense, like Olaf said. Um, this, is, this, is, this is a great example of using it today. However, the effect of this is not as great as it is on the passive technologies because, again, the air is moving very quickly in that system. whole bunch of technical references to go to. I know I'm out of time. Go to these references and look up and learn more about each one of these IAQ issues. 
um, here's some more for you to go to. If you've never been to Health Canada or the WHO, please go there and learn what you can about the topic. Okay, I, that was a lot. I ran up on time. Um, thank you very much for your patience and tolerance of sticking through this. Air quality is a tough topic with a lot of things to keep in mind. But again, this is our challenge going forward. We can make perfectly energy efficient buildings if we choose to do so, but the challenge is doing it in a way which is sustainable for people on the inside when we get done. Okay, that was all I had, Brett. Let me turn it back over to you. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks a lot. And for those of you uh, on here, stay with us here for a second. A uh, quick message to those listening on demand. Um, go ahead and take your uh, quiz at the end of this to get your continuing ed. But for now, uh, thanks for listening in, and we're going to go ahead and end the uh, session recording um, for now. So thank you.